Good afternoon to you viewers, it's the Colonel speaking to you live from the Grange for British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. Today, parts three and four, uh, I did parts one and two um, just a moment ago, of The Speaking of Verse by John Drinkwater, the Oxfordshire poet. Here we go. He continues, make sure it is, it is side three. Here we go. In approaching a poem with the intention of speaking it aloud, we should first get the rhythmic structure very clearly shaped in our minds. I think a good way to do this is to say the poem over quite slowly, with no particular concern for its meaning. Let the voice follow the rhythm without resistance, taking the stresses on their natural fall. Thus, fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. That is not the way to read it, but it is a right foundation. With the rhythm clearly defined in this way, we can without difficulty begin to knit the verses up into their right pace and energy. But in doing this, we have to be fixed upon never breaking that fundamental rhythm in any circumstances whatever. With long practice in verse speaking, the individual speaker will find himself giving a shade of emphasis here and there upon a word to suit his own instinct. It is a license that he may be allowed but he must employ it with the strictest economy. And I think that he should not employ it at all until he has become thoroughly assured in his use of the basic method that I have tried to indicate. This method, incompetently used, falls into monotony. But no method is discredited because it sometimes is adopted by dullards. Otherwise, there is none that could survive in authority. Even rightly used, this method will be called monotonous by some people, that there are people who have lost or have never discovered their capacity for listening. And to people who cannot listen, spoken verse means nothing. It has to be acted, grimaced, and belabored before it makes any impression. And then it is not at all the impression that the poet intended. If we are to receive the true effect of beautiful verse, well spoken, we can receive it through our ears and in no other way. Some people not only think that they don't like poetry, but actually are incapable of liking it. But I believe that they are very few. Many who have never before enjoyed poetry find on hearing it read that after a little while they are really listening for the first time in their lives and that words are taking on a strange new quality. The discovery is one of delight, and it is one that it is the function of verse speaking to extend. I have heard a young woman of 20 stand up on a platform in Glasgow, and by saying a lyric by W.B. Yeats, excite an audience of 2,000 people as deeply as could any master of the piano or violin. But she said the lyric. She did not play tricks upon it, and she did not try to interpret it. She stood with her feet firmly together and her hands firmly behind her, and she surrendered herself to the poem. These things do not need to be interpreted. They need just to be spoken. Nine-tenths of the great poetry of the world is perfectly clear in its meaning and we do not want the speaker to explain it to us. If Keats or Arnold or Thomas Hardy is unable to explain himself, no one else is likely to make much of the job for him. Concerning this matter of interpretation, may I quote words of my own, written with reference to acting, but applicable even more precisely to verse speaking, since the speaking of a poem is a much less complex affair than the playing of a part the significance of a poem being generally much less questionable 
than that of a part in a play. Right, viewers, off we go to side, f well, the second side of this record, but side four of the lecture. The words are these. The theory of interpretation is responsible for many vagaries on the stage. The actor is an executive, and I hope that no actor will do me the injustice of supposing that I say this of a calling that I worship this side of idolatry, in disparagement. It is sometimes argued that a creative work of art may and should mean many different things to different people, that it is in fact susceptible of many different interpretations, each one of which may be logically vindicated. This I believe to be a fallacy. The most notorious storm center for this particular opinion is perhaps the path and with it the play of Hamlet. It is no unusual thing for the attitude towards a new actor of Hamlet to be one of speculation as to what freshness he will bring to the interpretation of the part. Argument about Hamlet is admittedly endless, and admittedly able critics differ in their conclusions. But the argument and differences do not mean that Shakespeare himself was not sure about what he meant when he wrote Hamlet. Unless creative purpose and achievement are to go for nothing, he knew precisely what his intention was. And if we say that he may have meant any or all of a dozen different things, we either accuse him of gross inefficiency as an artist, or confess ourselves to be adultates. We have certainly every right to say humbly that of so vast a conception and form, we are unable to determine the exact and full significance. And in so far as this is so, to be curious as to any clues that this, that, or the other performance may afford us. But this is not at all the same thing as saying that it is of itself a commanding merit in the part that there may be a dozen proper ways of playing it. There is only one proper way of playing Hamlet. And while we may never decide what that way is, we ought to recognize that so long as we remain in doubt, we are doing less than justice to Shakespeare. The advocate of interpretation would say that it was not a question of making the best of our limitations, but a positive enrichment of experience to see 12 actors play Hamlet in 12 different ways. But the advocate of Shakespeare feels that the real enrichment would be to see 12 actors played in the same way and be convinced that all of them had discovered the secret. For to the riddle contained in every great work of art, there may be 20 plausible answers, but there can be only one right one. And so, in speaking a poem, let us first get the rhythmic movement clearly fixed in our minds. By following this, we shall give to each word the exact emphasis intended by the poet and so avoid those inflections that are designed to brace up the nerveless speech of conversation. The right pace of a poem will suggest itself quite readily to any sensitive mind, though poetry in general has, as it were, a much more common measure in this respect than might be supposed. A good reader generally strikes an average pace in his method from which he departs only in exceptional circumstances. And then, with this simple but sufficient equipment, let us say the poem without feeling ourselves called upon to interpret it, and we shall do all that is necessary. In conclusion, let me add this simplicity in verse speaking, a simplicity that is capable of great beauty, is unlikely to appeal to anyone who has not some judgment as to what poetry is worth speaking at all. Rubbish cannot survive treatment by this method, but the survival of rubbish is not likely to concern anyone for whom the method has any meaning. But poetry, living verse, takes on an added delight when so treated, both for the speaker and his hearers. Well, there we go, viewers. That was jolly informative, wasn't it? Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, and goodbye.